place we could be in the presence of Jesus with family. Y'all ready to worship today? Come on, hands together. so good to be together as a church family. My name is Brandon, and uh, as we continue to worship, uh, I want to invite us all together to read our call to worship today from Psalms chapter 43. It's going to come up on the screens, and I want to invite you to read out loud. I believe there's something powerful that happens when the people of God read the Word of God aloud. So let's lift our voice, and let's read together from Psalms chapter 43. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity that we have today to worship you. Receive these songs of worship and praise. Let them be a sweet sound into your ear. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. My name is uh, Kenneth Reed. Me and my wife have been attending here at church for uh, about 12 years. I serve on both the prayer team as well as the baptism team. This morning I get to do one of my favorite things and that's read scripture with you all. So today we're going to be reading from Isaiah 2 as we're celebrating this week joy during the Advent season. At the end of the scripture, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and you guys will say back, thanks be to God. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all came ready to worship this morning. Can't you feel the presence of Jesus in this place? The presence of peace, the presence of his joy, his hope. Jesus, you have our hearts. You are our strength and our song. Sing. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. From north to south and east to west, we hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole echoing his imminent, his name would burst from sea and sky. I need you to sing your song loud this morning. Come on, sing it with me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified.
I'm convinced the presence of Jesus is here. Come on, if you believe the peace of God is in this place, say amen. Come on, if you believe that you have his joy in your heart, say amen. Come on, all across this room, would you lift your hands with me, church, to our King, to Emmanuel. Let's sing this prayer with me. I won't bow to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be fooled by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. again this weekend. Love you, man. Well, before you're seated, could you do something? Listen, it's Christmas time. Why don't you introduce yourself to somebody that you've never met before, and then you can find your seat. Well, good morning. Lee, you care to join me this week, or are you just yeah, meeting somebody? I'm you good? Yeah. This is Lee's favorite part of the service, you guys. Yeah, Got to meet a bunch I, I of new people. I didn't want to miss out on that. Yeah. Us introverts, we before, hate that part but of I met service. Jill. So, Jill, good to see you again today. You're my guinea pig of who I got to meet, but she's like, we've already met. That happens to me all the time. Yeah, that's great. Sorry about that, guys. If you get reintroduced by Lee, know that he's not remembering your names, apparently. So, 
Hey, good to I meet all you guys. It's good to see all of you guys this weekend. We're glad that you're hanging out with us. I want to sp say a special welcome to anybody joining us online this weekend. And those of you here in the room, we are in week three of a series on Advent. We're talking about the Advent of joy this week. Pastor Witt will be out in just a minute to continue that series. But we do want to say a special welcome to anyone who's new this weekend. If you're here for the very first time, I know we have a lot of families that join us for the first time each and every weekend. And as a creature of habit, I know how big a deal it is to try something new, and we're just so glad that you're here with us, and we don't really want you to stay new around here, so do this for us. Text NEW to 23101, and we're going to send you a gift card, again, to say thank you for spending your weekend with us. Church family, let's put our hands together. Welcome anyone who's here for the first time. Yeah. We're glad you're here. We are. We are. Welcome. Welcome. Speaking of doing things new, I, I like the beginning of the year. I, I like kind of a refresh, a restart. And I've got a, something I want to invite you to that maybe you haven't taken this step yet. It's a monthly thing that we do around here called The Next Move. Maybe you've been here for a little while. You like the church, but you're like, how do I get connected? How do I yep. get to know people? How do I find out what things the church has maybe for me or for my kids or for our family? The hey, best thing to do is to join us at Next Move. Well, our next one is happening in January. And I can't think of a better way to kick off the new year if you haven't done that yet. We, we share a meal together. You hear a little bit about who we are, where we're headed as a church, yep. and we get a chance to know you a little bit as well. So if you haven't done that yet, text the word NEXT to 23101. And you can get information about our January next move, and you can get signed up right there as well. Yeah, it's hard to believe that the next next move we have is in it's a January. new year. I know. You know. As we rapidly approach the end of the year, uh, we are only two weeks away from our annual Christmas event that we have every single year here. Um, and this year, it's our Christmas concert, second year of uh, kind of doing this format. If you've never participated in Christmas with us um, in one of our Christmas services, there's going to be a lot of music, really a lot of fun for the whole family. And we would invite you to participate this year. Bring somebody with you. Christmas and Easter are two great times a year to invite someone, maybe a neighbor, a co-worker, an extended family member who doesn't have a church home. We would love for you to bring them with you this year. We have six different services. Thursday the 21st at 6.30, Friday the 22nd at 6.30, the 23rd we will have two Saturday night services, four and six, and then Sunday morning Christmas Eve at nine, and this 10.30 service will actually be at 11 a.m. on Christmas Eve. So we, again, we invite you to join us for our Christmas Christmas concerts this year. Yeah, it's going to be a special weekend. We can't wait to celebrate Christmas together that weekend. Well, this is a season of giving. With yeah. a couple weeks left before Christmas, you're probably still trying to finalize like meaningful gifts for the people in your life that yeah. you love. But it's also a season of giving for us as a church, kind of in the trajectory of who we are as a church. God's been inviting us into generosity, which has always been true. In fact, in all of our services, we take time to worship and honor God with our giving. And if you've never done that before around here, it's pretty easy. You can just text the word GIVE to yep. 23101, and you'll get instructions there on how you can give electronically. You can do it right here in the service. Or if you came prepared to give in the room, cash, or check, there's envelopes in the seat backs in front of you. And there are drop boxes at all of, your ex at all of our exits. We so appreciate the generosity of our church family. But the last few months, we've been talking about something kind of special yep. around giving. In fact, on our digital platforms, you might see there's a new designation there, EXP, and that stands for Experience. Expansion. God's mission is meant to expand. His church is meant to expand. And we feel here at Church on the Move that God is leading us to see our churches expand, to see his kingdom expand here in the world. And thankfully, we don't have to figure this all out right now. Others have come before us who have helped expand so that we could know Christ. Yeah, that's right. You know, one of the cool things about being part of a church that's now 36 years old is there's a lot of men and women who, as Lee's saying, have come before us that have been through seasons like the one we're about to enter into, that have been through a bunch of different seasons just following God. You know, it's one of the reasons that Paul says in the New Testament several times, the older should teach the younger, is that we can learn from the experiences and the faith of those that have come before us. Because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And so when we hear these stories today, that we're gonna show you three of them, it's meant to build your and I's faith who may be venturing into this new area with God for the very first time. And we've been spending a lot of time with Church on the Movers and just been asking, hey, how has God shown up in your life in past seasons where you've been obedient and faithfully followed him when he's asked you to step out and give to a campaign like what we're entering into? So we have three of those that we wanna share with you this morning. So check these out. We've been part of Church on the Move for 32 years. Since 1996, a long time. We have been going to uh, Church on the Move for, gosh, about 12 years now. We've been attending Church on the Move Broken Arrow since the PAC. Woo woo! <laughs> 
any time that we have ever given, it's always been maybe not necessarily the easiest, but completely worth it. It's, it's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Whenever I moved from Louisiana, it was because of Hurricane Rita, and I lost everything in the storm. I was eating at the Salvation Army, and I didn't have a place to stay, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do. When I got to Tulsa, and I remember getting a phone call saying, hey, Mr. Griffith, the Oklahoma Housing Authority has an apartment for you for 12 months. It's completely paid for and full. I really believe that if I hadn't given in the times before, that that would have never happened. It just starts with that one act of obedience. You just trust God that whenever you give it unto Him and you release it, what you release out of your hands, he'll release what the kingdom has for you. The last campaign, I got a number, and I thought, is that Satan trying to get me to do something stupid, or is, you know, is this God trying to get me to, to trust him? We were in debt to our eyeballs, and, and this was a commitment. There was no way we were gonna be able to make it, you know, on our own. If this was God telling us to do it, he was gonna provide a way for us to do it. So we committed to the amount, and uh, that was in April. By December of that year, we paid the entire commitment. We paid off everything we owed but our house. It was, it was pretty amazing. So when we first decided to give 27 years ago, it was difficult to give, because at the time when we were giving, we were taking a list to the grocery store. And a calculator. And a calculator. We gave $30. And we purposed in our heart that that comes first. Malachi 3.10 says, test me and see that I will not open up the windows of heaven. Had we not taken that step, there is no way we would be where we are today. Once you have the experience, once he's proven himself faithful to you, and he will, you'll never question whether this was the right decision to give or not. When you put first his kingdom, he just makes everything, you know, work. You know, you sow, you reap, you give, you know, he gives back unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Oh, it absolutely built our faith. He proved to us that, that if he told us to do something beyond our reach, he would provide a way for us to do it. I think back from when we were over at the Interchange Business Park, and I think the people that started out in the hotel in the first service made it possible for us to be there. And then we made it possible for people to be here. It, it's, it's amazing how that works. So we're real excited. I'm excited to see what God's gonna do this time, <laughs> you know. Well, good morning. Merry Christmas to everybody. Good to see you this weekend. Not sure exactly what brought you here. Some of you are regulars. Some of you, maybe this is your first time. Welcome. Really, really glad you're here. My name is Witt, and uh, we're glad you're here this weekend. We're going to have a great weekend together. For those of you who have been around for a while or are interested in this campaign that we have coming up, next weekend is a significant weekend. It's our uh, Pledge and First Gifts weekend. And what that means is that what we're asking for you to do is to bring back one of these pledge cards if you're planning on participating in this Missio Day campaign. Lee just talked about it. Chris just talked about it. It's a campaign over two years to raise $20 million amongst our three local churches to expand into the Tulsa area in some significant ways. If you want to know more about that, there's a lot of information and pictures and that kind of thing out in the lobby. Of course, our team would be happy to walk that through with you. And we have these Missio Day books that we've created. These are awesome. They answer so many questions and explain what we're gonna be doing over the next couple of years. But for those of you who are ready to participate, next weekend's gonna be a significant weekend because we're bringing these pledge cards and my ask to you this whole time has not been, would you give to this, but would you ask God if he would have you participate in this? And if the answer is yes, then great, participate. If not, no pressure. And so for those of you who are planning to participate, what we're asking is you to bring this back filled out next weekend as to the pledge amount that you're intending to give over the next two years. And then our goal is to try to raise as much as we can toward the $20 million goal by the end of the year. And let me explain why. We have some of these projects, we're ready to go. Like literally we have uh, an opportunity that's right in front of us. I can only tell you it's a God opportunity. I, I, I am anticipating sharing more with you about this in the very near future. But your giving will allow us to be able to pull the trigger on that, something that I think will be really, really great 
for Church on the Move, and you're going to be really excited about to hear. In addition to the expansion project here at Tulsa, something that we're ready to pull the trigger on again, but your giving will make that possible. The, 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 the more we get in the beginning, the sooner we'll be able to start. And so if we can give as much as we can by the end of the year, that will make this project uh, a little bit more possible a, a little sooner. And so uh, our goal is to try to raise 20%. That's $4 million. We've already taken $2 million of money that you're already giving on a regular basis and set that aside. So we've already got 10% of our goal. We are on the way. But if we could raise another 10%, by the end of the year. And let me just tell you, that's doable. We've done it before, we can do it again. And uh, if we could do that, we will be well on our way toward our $20 million goal. So next weekend is gonna be impactful. If you wanna bring uh, your kids in here because you're planning to give together as a family, this will be a special moment, I, I promise you. This won't just be drop this in a little you know, box somewhere on your way out the door. We're, we're gonna make this meaningful because I believe it is meaningful. These are holy moments. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had a church on the mover grab me after the Saturday night service, and he was so excited to be able to give his gift. It was interesting. I was, it was amazing because he, he, you could see the look on his face. It wasn't one of dread, oh God, how am I going to do this? It was anticipation. He was excited. He was saying, I'm giving more than I've ever given in my life. Pastor, what would you pray with me? And it was my honor and privilege to stand right over there and pray with him. But it was such a holy moment, and we want that experience for all of you. Um, next weekend, the kind of experience where you can bring your gift to the Lord, because that's who you're giving to. This isn't to me, this is to the Lord, and so it's going to be it's going to be a really impactful service. So uh, next weekend, that's what that's going to be, and uh, you want to make special plans for that? Please do so. It'll be really, really meaningful. So anyway, uh, this weekend we are in week three of our Advent series, and uh, there are four themes of Advent: hope, peace, joy, and love. This weekend we're talking about the Advent of joy, the coming. Of joy, and we're going to look at a familiar Christmas text. So, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter two, and we'll read this together. It'll be up on the screen. If you didn't bring a Bible, it says this. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light into our path. And so we come to this moment not just um, casually, but we come intentionally asking you to illuminate our spiritual imagination and the path in front of us, Lord. We want to be more like Jesus. So show us Jesus today in this text. Help us to see you above all else because we know that when we see you, we'll see ourselves more clearly. Life becomes more clear. The clearer we see you, the more everything else becomes clear around us. And so, Lord, we want to see you today. Open our eyes, open our ears to hear from you and to see what it is that you want to say to us. Lord, we thank you for this text, for what it will mean, and what it will say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, we're talking about the advent of joy. What does it mean from a Christian perspective to experience joy? How does it happen? Where does it come from? And there's a few thoughts I want to pull from this text. The first one is this, that great joy is a response to good news. Let me say that again. Great joy is a response to to good news. I want to remind you of what was said in chapter, or excuse me, Luke 2.10. The angel of the Lord says to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. Everybody say good news. Good news of great joy. Notice that good news precedes great joy, and that's because great joy is a product of, it's a, it's a, it's a response to good news. Good news is at the very heart of the Christian faith. In fact, the word gospel itself means good news. 
as a sort of in contrast to every other ideology, every other sort of religious perspective or pathway out there, Christianity stands alone in that it's built on good news and not good advice. There's a difference between good news and good advice. Our world is filled with good advice, some religious advice, some practical advice. There's no shortage of good advice out there. You can find good advice about just about anything, how to sleep better, how to exercise, what you should eat, how to resolve conflict, marital advice, you name it, you can find good advice all over the place. There's no shortage of it in our world. There is, however, a shortage of good news. And the way we respond to good advice and good news is very different. It's one thing to sit down with a financial advisor and have them give you good advice on how you should save for your future and manage your money wisely. That's good advice. Then it's good to take that kind of advice. It might be helpful. It might even be life-changing, but that's very different from having someone tell you, you just won the lottery. The response that you would give to, I just won the lottery versus, here's some good financial advice, very different. And that's because we respond differently to good news than we do to good advice. Christianity is not based on good news or good, good advice. Good advice is about what you do. That's what good advice is. Here's what you ought to do. And every other religious system out there is built on good advice. Here's how you ought to behave and if you want to please God. Here's how you should behave if you want to get to heaven. Here's how you should behave if you want to be one of the good people. That's how every other, every other world philosophy, every other religious system, it's all built on good advice. In other words, what you must do. But Christianity stands alone in its contrast in that it is not built on good advice. Make no mistake. Christianity is filled with good advice, but that's not the core of our faith. In fact, the good things that we do, and you might read through the scripture and say, wait a minute, I find all sorts of do's and don'ts in the scripture. Yes, you do, but those do's and don'ts come on the other side of the good news of what God has done on your behalf. In other words, you're not saved because of how good you've lived, because of the spiritual resume that you've built up, because you've been a really good person before God and maybe he'll let you into his presence when you die. That is not the basis of Christianity. The basis of Christianity is that God came while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That God reconciled us to him in Christ by sending his own son. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came, lived a perfect life, the life that you could not live, so that he could give you his righteousness in exchange for him taking on your sin. What a trade, and yet that's the story of Christmas. That's the good news. And that's why we're to be filled with great joy. That's why these shepherds were to be filled with great joy, because the angels were declaring to them that a Savior, the Messiah, one who would come and deliver their people, from their sin and bondage. I think about Juneteenth, if you're familiar with the holiday, and I've only in the last few years become more familiar with what it means. It basically is the day where we remember the last of the slaves who, when the word came to them that they had been freed, uh, that's what Juneteenth commemorates. And I think about that. Could you imagine what it would be like to have been a slave and to get word that now you're free? That's good news. Could you imagine how that news would change your life, how it might change your perspective, how you might fall to your knees in gratitude that you're no longer a slave? That's the story of Christianity, only writ large, because we were slaves to ourselves, to our desires, to our sin nature. We could not, we could not, and this is why God doesn't give us good advice to save ourselves, is because Good advice isn't enough to save us because we're incapable of keeping it on our own. That's the problem, is we can't even get out of our own way. So we need someone to save us, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Can I read to you from uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15? This is a, a text about what Jesus has done for us, about what he purchased for us when he came. And this is what it says. It says, you were dead. In fact, let's, let's just personalize this kind of communally, church on the move, we were dead because of our sins and because of our sinful nature. This is our story. This is where we come from. This is our history. This is our past. We were dead because of our sins and because of our sinful nature was not yet cut away 
But then God made us alive with Christ. We were dead, not just sick, not dying, not on our way to a really bad place. We were dead. But then God made us alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. I mean, that's amazing news. It means you don't have to live a perfect life or even a good life before God to get him to forgive you. He has purchased forgiveness for you already. You're forgiven. That's amazing. He's forgiven your sins. He's canceled the record of charges against us and took them away by nailing them to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, the spirits that we were enslaved to, our own fleshly, selfish desires. He disarmed them and he shamed them publicly by his victory on the cross. This is the good news of Christmas, that Jesus came to do what we could not do for ourselves. Christianity is not built on good advice. It's built on good news. Here's my question for you. Do you really believe it? And are you living in the light of that good news? Or do you function more under sort of the Christian perspective of good advice? See, there's a lot of people who believe in Jesus, but they treat him like his main job is to give good advice. And so, so for many of us, we live with this sort of view of God that we're never quite doing enough, that God is never really pleased with us. But I want to ask you, what would it mean for you? How would you live your life if you believed that God was really pleased with you? If you believed that he had really forgiven your sins, would you doubt yourself? What would you fear if you believed that God was really for you? Would you worry about your future if you, if you really, truly believed that he was completely and utterly committed to you? Would you doubt yourself if you knew, if you really didn't know and believed deep down inside that you really were the righteousness of God in Christ, not because of your own achievement, but because of what Jesus has in his grace gifted to you? That's the good news of the gospel, and we're a people who are called to live in light of that, and so of course, there would be great joy. You don't have to be who you always have been. You can be different, you can change, not by your own power, but by the power of Christ working in you, and if that's your testimony, if God has done that in your life, could you just wave at me and say, "With that's my story this morning. Come on, look around. There's a lot of people here who were different, but who, who used to be another way, but now they've been set free by the grace and mercy of God. Come on, give God praise this morning. That's our story, that's the good news. The second thing I wanna highlight for you about joy and the advent of joy is that joy is a product of presence. See, that's the story of Christmas, is the story of a God who came close. Look at what it says in Luke 2.12. The angel says this to the shepherds, and this will be a sign for you. In other words, how will you know that what we're saying is true? How do you know that a savior has come? How, how can I know that God is really going to redeem us? This will be the sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. God was so committed to redeeming mankind that he came close. He didn't just try to save us from a distance. He got close. He was so committed to breaking into the human experience that he became one of us. And that's the story of scripture. It's not the story of man searching for God. It's the story of God looking for man. That's amazing to think about. We often think that we're looking for God and we're searching for him, but the truth is God is looking for you. God wants relationship with us more than we have wanted relationship with him. And that's what Christmas is all about, that God is so committed to relationship with us that he actually became one of us. Not just like one of us, he became one of us. He's a human being. You will find a baby lying in a manger. This is his commitment of presence. God wants to be with us. That's amazing. 
I grew up a, a Michael Jordan fan. I, I was kind of, I don't know, coming of age when he was in his prime. It was the great days. I remember we didn't have, you know, as many channels as we have now, but we had WGN Chicago, which meant we got to watch all the Bulls home games. I don't know how many of you remember WGN Chicago, getting to watch Michael Jordan play, all of those games. I used to watch them all the time. He was my, like my hero. I mean, I, I made drawings of him. I had pictures, posters hanging on my wall in my bedroom. He was who I wanted to be. And then he retired. He went to play baseball. You remember this? He went to play baseball for about a year and a half. I was devastated because he was my hero. I loved watching him play basketball, and now he wasn't playing anymore. But then you remember, he came back, and oh my goodness, how amazing it was when he issued that, that fact statement, that press release, I'm back. It was just like the greatest day of my life. And that next season, the next full season that he played, I, I, I made a promise to myself that I was going to do whatever it took to see him play live. I'd never seen him play in person before. And so I was, I was like, I'm going to see him play this season because who knows when he's going to retire again. So I don't want to miss my chance. And so I, I made a commitment to get tickets. I talked to my dad. I was probably, I don't know, 18, 19 years old at the time. Made, uh, you know, asked him, hey, can we, can we go see MJ? And he was like, yes, we can. And so we looked. We we're going to go see him in Dallas. We we're going to play the Mavericks at Reunion Arena. This is before they played, where they play now. And the way you had to get tickets, this is pre-internet. The way you had to get tickets back then was to get on the phone and call somebody on the opening day of ticket sales. And I, I don't know where I found the number for, you know, the Mavericks ticket office. And uh, I was supposed to call them at a certain day when tickets went on sale. And I still remember being in my office and just dialing and getting the busy signal, boop, 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 redial, redial, redial. Finally, I get through. And I get somebody on the other line trying to get tickets. Hey, I want tickets to the Bulls game. I had no idea how popular those tickets were going to be. I just knew I wanted to see Michael Jordan, apparently, along with the rest of the world. And so they're like, well, what, what tickets are you looking for? I'm like, I don't know. What have you got? And they said, well, do you just want us to give you the best available tickets? I'm like, Yeah. Give me the best available seats. Like, what, what do you have? I'll take it. We will take the best available seats. So buy the tickets and uh, waited months. It was, you know, the, the, the tickets went on sale way before the season started. So we waited months. Finally, game day comes around and we drive down to Dallas. I'm there with my dad and my buddy Josh. We're super excited to get there. I can't wait to see where these seats, because in my heart, I just know, like, they're going to be really good seats. We're going to be, like, down Front is going to be awesome. And so we get in there, and I'm looking at like the sections, and it dawns on me that no, no, we're not on the lower level. We need to go up a level. We need to go up a level. We need to go up a level. We get to the highest level. We get to our section. I'm like, all right, well, this isn't so bad looking down. It was kind of like, you know what it feels like when you're in one of those really steep arenas and it almost feels like you're just going to tip right over and land on the floor? It's kind of like that. And I'm like, well, hopefully, like, we're down front. But I look down and I'm like, no, we're not, we're not on the first row. Second row, third row, we start climbing the stairs. Climbing, climbing, climbing. Gang, we get to the very top of the arena. There are no more rows left. We're in the last row. These are the best available seats. I'm a little bit heartbroken, but at least I'm in the room. We're there, I don't know, like an hour, hour and a half before game time. And I look down, and there he is. He's on the court and he's warming up and it's so early. I'm like, maybe we can go down and get closer. And so we do. We, we go down and we're just standing there, I don't know, probably 100 feet away from just watching him. There he is, the man, the myth, the legend, the greatest of all time. Sorry, LeBron fans, it's not close. MJ is the goat. <laughs> and there he is. I'm watching him warm up. I mean, this is someone that I had watched like, I mean, I had all the VHS tapes, Come Fly With Me, Michael Jordan's Playground. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I have worn these tapes out watching them day after day after day, and there he is. I'm finally going to get to see him play. Played a great game that night. They played the Mavericks. The Mavericks were good. They had Jason Kidd. They had Michael Finley. Played the Bulls to overtime, but MJ had 37, and they won. It was a great game. Amazing experience. Got to see my hero. Now, I want you to imagine with me, that part's all true, this part didn't happen, but I want you to imagine, what if it did? What if MJ was just as excited, actually strike that, more excited to see me there at the arena? Wit! You made it! 
come here. What if he was more excited to see me than I was to see him? That's the story of Christmas. A God, our hero, more excited to be in your presence than you are even to be in his. That's amazing to think about. And yet, that's the story that we rehearse, we, we remember every year around this time. Dr. Jim Wilder, who is a psychologist, he's also has a master's degree in theology, written several books. He, he defines joy in this way, and I love this definition of joy. He says this, joy is a state of elation we experience when someone is glad to be with us. You know that feeling? Like when you walk in a room and someone's face lights up because now you're there? It's a feeling. Dads, I think you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I get this feeling still whenever I come home and my girls who are still young enough to be excited that dads come home from work. You know what I'm talking about, dads? When I walk in the back door and there they are, they don't know, they've been playing on their iPad or whatever or watching some show, but the door closes and I walk in and all of a sudden it's, Daddy! Man, I mean, like it doesn't get much better than that. Am I right, dads? As my daughters run over to me, they want to hug me, their faces light up. They're just happy that I'm in the room. That is a wonderful experience of joy. I'll never forget 25 years ago or nearly 25 years ago, standing in this very room, in fact, somewhere in this very spot watching my soon wife-to-be, Heather, come walking down that aisle right there. I will, there's a lot I don't remember about that day. I'm not great with like memories, but I will never forget the look on her face. She was beaming, and, and, and those of you who know her, she was also crying too. <laughs> the smile, like ear to ear, as she walked down the aisle. I'll never forget that pure joy. That's the idea. To be in the presence of someone who's delighted to be with you. And, and what Dr. Wilder says is that this isn't like an option for healthy, functional human beings. Like we need this. We're hardwired for this. It's amazing. When a baby is born, one of the core components to its development is that a caregiver a mom, a dad, someone look that baby in the eye and stare into their face and delight over them. Moms, you know what this feels like. You're holding that little newborn baby and you're just staring into his or her eyes, just delighting in your child. There's more there than just motherly affection. What you're actually doing by delighting in your child is forming neural pathways, Highways of the mind that actually train the child on how to experience joy. In other words, if you don't get this, it's much harder for you to understand how to get to joy in your mind. That's why as parents, it's so important that we delight in our kids like this. And so this is what it, what, what's a core part of our development is that, is that our caregiver, our mother, our father would hold us and look into our eyes and delight over us because what's happening in the brain is, is remarkable. In fact, uh, Sherry Robbins, who works for the Center for Family Transformation, she writes this. She says, as a caregiver and infant engage in face-to-face -face interactions, the emotionally expressive face of the caregiver causes the developing child's brain, look at this, to be altered, to mimic the brain of the adult as a result of positive Joyful interactions, the baby's brain experiences elation or joy, which further results in the brain's reward center releasing opioids, also known as hormones like dopamine or oxytocin. As a caregiver's actions cause the infant's brain to experience joy, I love this term, the amplified joy in the child's brain mirrors back to the adult further increasing the joy that the adult brain experiences. It's like an escalating volley of joy as parent and child delight in one another. David would write in Psalm 16 this about being in the presence of God. He says this, You make known to me the path of life. 
In your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. That word fullness is an interesting word, shows up a few times in the Old Testament, usually referring to eating to your full. You know what this feels like at Thanksgiving, we just experienced this. Anybody go over to mom's house or grandma's house and eat until you can't eat anymore? You know what that feels like? What David is saying is that in your presence there is all you can eat joy. Joy till you're full. Not just a little bit of joy, not just a fleeting kind of joy, not just a blip of joy, but all you can eat kind of joy. And he says that this joy comes in your presence. In other words, to be in your presence, there is fullness of joy. There's something that happens in me when I'm around you. That word Presence is also significant. It's the Hebrew word pana. And it's used in the Old Testament, check this out, more than 2,000 times. And most of the time, you know what that word is translated as? Face. In your face, there is fullness of joy. We say this Hebrew word in English, a translation of it, every week when we end our services from Numbers chapter six. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his to shine upon you. What is he saying? He's saying, the Lord's, may the Lord's face light up when you walk in the room. I want you to think about this because I don't know about you, but I've heard pastors and preachers tell me time and time and time again that I need to delight in the Lord, that I need to enjoy him above all else. And yes, that's true. But can I hopefully maybe blow your mind with a little bit of a different idea? I I wonder if this verse is not telling me that you need, I need to delight in the Lord, but rather that the Lord delights in me. Like, what if that's true? Because, see, I I wonder how many of us can believe that God loves us? Like, that's not hard for you to believe. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's a wonderful truth. We can believe that God loves us, but we struggle to accept that he likes us. And so whenever you pray, maybe your image of God is of a disapproving father. When was the last time you were at church? Do you know how long it's been since you've read your Bible? Like we see all of the judgments that maybe, all of the insecurities, all the areas that we've fallen short when maybe when you step into God's presence, he's just delighted that you're there. See, this is the picture that Jesus gives of the Father when he finds one who has been lost. Do you remember Luke 15? There's three parables in Luke 15, the most famous one being the parable of the prodigal son, but there's two others that precede it. One who is looking for a lost sheep and a woman who's looking for her lost coin. Can I read these to you? Listen to how Jesus describes his emotion, the emotion of heaven, the emotion of God, the emotion of his own emotion when we Step into his presence. Look at what he says. He says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. There's a celebration. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, Jesus says, I tell you, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He continues, verse eight, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I have lost just so I tell you There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then finally, we get the story of the prodigal son, and when he finally comes home, verse 20 of Luke 15, but while he was still a long way off, how does the father respond? Does he cross his arms and say, well, it's about time. I hope you learned your lesson. No. 
How does he respond when he was still a long way off? His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and kissed him. How would it change your life, your prayer life, your view of yourself, if you could really believe that God was delighted to have you in his presence? If you could begin to see your heavenly father delighting over you, I wonder if like a little baby staring up at its mother, if you would start to feel joy in his presence knowing that he was delighted at yours. The story of Christmas is not the story of a God who stayed at a distance to try to save us, but rather came and got right into our situation, stepped into the worst of what humanity has to offer in order to be with us so he could pull us out of the mess that we had made for ourselves. We have a God who delights in us. Joy is the product of presence. And finally, and I'll close here, joy unexpressed is also joy unfulfilled. Joy is a communal emotion. Have you noticed that when you get good news, when something wonderful happens, you want to just share it. I mean, it's almost, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know, it's a little bit of a buzzkill, right? When something wonderful happens, but you have no one to share it with, you have no one to tell, you have no one who would understand. When you experience something wonderful, something incredible, something almost too good to be true, you just, you want to share it with other people, and that's exactly what we see here. We see these angels not only sharing this good news with the shepherds, but they're singing together in in, in, in an amazing heavenly chorus. Look at Luke 2, 13 and 14 again. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Joy is meant to be communal because joy is meant to be shared. I think we know what this feels like when we go to a football game or a basketball game. We watch our team play. You ever been to a game where maybe you, you were just going to see your favorite team play? I remember seeing the 49ers play the Cowboys a couple of years ago. I'm in Dallas, uh, Texas Stadium, and I'm there as a 49ers fan. There's a lot of Cowboys fans, but there's a lot of red. Do you know the solidarity I felt with my brothers and sisters in red that day? We won the game, and it was amazing. I'm cheering every good play. It's like I'm meeting new friends all around me. I'm hugging. I'm touching people I would not normally touch high-fiving, people, complete strangers, because we share in something together. Joy is meant to be shared. Do you, do you understand that that's what the church is? That's why we gather together. How many of you found in 2020 that church just wasn't the same at home in your living room, in your pajamas? That you're meant to share this experience, that there's something about us, that we're, that we're inextricably tied to each other. That just being in the presence, even of people that I, don't, that I don't completely know, there's something powerful about it. And even showing up here and being around the people that I know, people that I care about and people that care about me. Last week, I, I got to experience this right down here on the front row. I came in. I didn't go to, I wasn't at all the services last weekend. Pastor Blake filled in for me. I wanted to see uh, the Lincoln Bulldogs compete in the state championship. And by the way, they won. It was awesome. Good Congratulations, Bulldogs. Blake was gracious enough to speak on my behalf. And by the way, he did an amazing job. If you didn't hear last weekend, you should. One of the best messages on peace I've ever heard. But I came in to the service and I was sitting right over here where I'd normally sit. And I looked down and there's Lee right over here. And he's going down the row as he does, greeting all of our family, just hugging everybody. And I, I'm not a hugger, you guys, but man, I saw Lee coming, and not only did I, did I sort of resolve in my mind that I was going to be hugged, whether I liked it or not, but actually that I liked it and that I was looking forward to that hug because there's a joy we celebrate. It's not just I like Lee and he likes me, but men, we're here, like celebrating together that God is good and that God's been faithful to my family and that he's been faithful to your family. 
And that there's something in like an escalating joy when we get to celebrate that together. And so when we come together and we sing these songs, it's more than just about you and God, but we're encouraging one another as we do that. That's what the church is. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 5, he says, sing together to one another, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. We sing to each other and we sing to God. And as we declare how good and faithful God has been, We lift one another up. That's who we are. We're a family together. And so we're just a group of people who can't seem to go more than, I don't know, seven days without getting together and just remembering that God has been faithful, that God has delivered us, that God pulled us out of our past, that God is a redeemer, that he cares so much about us, he came close, that our God delights in us. And we have that in common. We have much to celebrate because we have a God who has done much for us. Can I get an amen, church on the moon? Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Let me pray for us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we have so much to be grateful for. In these last couple of weeks, Lord, I've just been reminded again of your kindness and compassion to our family to the Georges specifically, Lord, but I think about this Church on the Move family as well. It's amazing what you've done, your faithfulness to carry us through. Lord, thank you. Thank you for coming close. We don't want this season to go by and just make it about traditions and warm memories. and There's a lot of that we're thankful for, but Lord, most of all, we, we remember that you came close. You made yourself vulnerable to the point of death, so that we could be set free. Thank you for new life, for resurrection, for a new today and a new tomorrow, that our future doesn't have to be the same as our past, that we can be delivered, transformed, and set free. Only you, you can redeem the past, you can heal the wounds, only you can do that, and you did. Thank you, Lord. We're so grateful, we're so grateful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now look up here. If you're in the room today and you say, Whit, I haven't received the, the free gift of salvation that Jesus has on offer. I, I, I'm, not made, I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Maybe you've been living for yourself. Maybe you've been playing a religious game. I don't know what the case may be. I, I played a religious game for 30 plus years of my life, but you're ready to meet the real Jesus today. If that's you and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you're ready to accept the the free offer of salvation. You know, gifts have to be received. Someone could give you a gift, but if you do nothing with it, then the gift goes unrealized. So if you're ready to receive that gift today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that here in just a second. I'm going to count to three, and if that's you, I want you to raise your hand and say, Whit, I'm I'm, I'm giving my life fully to Christ today. If that's you, every head up, every eye open. We believe that this is something you ought to do in public. Jesus said, if you'll acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. It'll never get easier to say I'm living for Jesus than to do it in a room like this of people who are cheering you on. So if that's you today and you're ready to to receive the free gift of salvation and come home to the Father's house, would you raise your hand as I count to three? One, two, three. Three. Anybody in this room, just wave your, at me right over here. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just wave at me. Say, Whit, that's me. Yep, I see you right here. Yep, right there. Awesome. Over here. Yep, I see you. Awesome. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just wave at me up here somewhere. Great. Wonderful. As we close today, if that's you or if you have a prayer need, our prayer team is going to be down front. We would love the opportunity to pray with you. We know that we come to church with different situations and different needs. Maybe something's going on with your family. Maybe you got a financial thing going on, job related. I don't know, nothing's too big, nothing's too small. If you raised your hand or if you have a prayer need and you would like to talk to someone and pray with someone about it, meet us down front. Our prayer team will be standing right down here. Super casual, really easy. You don't have to know the Bible to be able to come and do that. You can just come and talk to someone and I'm telling you, We would love the opportunity to do that with you today. So as we leave, 
would you come forward? If you need to go get your kids first and come back in here, we'll be down here for a little bit. They'll be standing right here facing that direction, all right? We would love to be able to minister to you today. Stand to your feet. Don't forget, next weekend is December 16th and 17th, which is Pledge and First Gifts Weekend. It's gonna be a really special weekend. So I hope that you'll be here. Now let's close with this blessing out of Numbers chapter six, and I hope it has maybe a little bit more meaning for you today as we read it out loud together. Are you ready? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.